prop them up like that and stay or do he uh, stand up? How often is it that? Okay, we are live. Okay, natural sound. Hopefully you're hearing me babble. And I'm going to mute a second here. Okay. Uh, going to mute here in three, two, one.
was heavily armed, opening fire inside this private Christian grade school, which resulted in killing one eight-year-old and two nine-year-old children. Additionally, three adult employees were killed within the elementary school this morning, one of them being the headmaster. So at this time, I'm just going to ask them to join me in a moment of silence as we remember the victims and their families. Jay Grover, trustee, Sherry Steffens, trustee, Jude Kuhn, our district clerk, Dr. Brian Graham, superintendent, Ashley Dreyer, our initial Dreyer president, Sue Marston, vice president, uh, Joel Lamarca, trustee, Danielle Bruno, trustee, Mike Loria, assistant superintendent of curriculum, staff development, and human resources, Cheryl Cardone, assistant superintendent of pupil personnel services, and Dr. Ruby Harris, assistant superintendent for school business and finance. Just a couple of announcements. If you could silence your cell phones, please. We'd appreciate it. And there are emergency exits directly behind me and directly in front of me in case we have to leave unexpectedly. Um, and also, if we could note that uh, Glenn Bovic is excused, please. Okay, if I could have a motion to approve the agenda for this evening, March 27th. I'll move and a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. Moving on, if I could have an approval of the minutes from March 13th, 2023, please. I'll motion. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. Um, with us this evening, we have uh, student ambassadors from the middle school. We have uh, Eleanor Murray and uh, Gwen Murray. Good evening, Board of Education and Dr. Graham and the Great Island Community. Mr. Fitzpatrick and myself would like to welcome Eleanor Murray to the podium to talk a little bit about what we have going on at Veronica County Middle School. Good evening. My name is Eleanor Murray and I'm the Treasurer of the Middle School Student Council. In the past weeks, we have a spirit weeks along with the Shamrock Shuffle. In the week leading up to St. Patrick's Day, we started the week for our animal trips. On Tuesday, we had Hat Day followed by a Disney character day on Wednesday. Thursday was PG Day, and finally we were cream and St. Patrick's Day apparel on Friday. On Friday, we also celebrated St. Patrick's Day at the Shamrock Shuffle, where we had games, blow-ups, and foods. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on to the high school, uh, we have Casey Lowerwitz with us. My name is Casey Wellwitz, and I am here to speak on behalf of the Grand Island Senior High School about the events that occurred throughout the month of March. In the past week, GIHS showed their Viking pride with Spirit Week and Clash of the Vikings. Each grade competed to win $1,000 for their class with the points earned through contests and lunch, dress-up days, and the games on Clash nights. Additionally, students could gain points for their class by bringing in items for the toiletry drive and handing in a signed Donate Life pledge regarding organ donation. Monday was Teacher Student Swap Day, and on Tuesday, students wore their best wine gear for Tropical Tuesday. The next day, we went back in time for Way Back Wednesday. Seniors dressed up in 60s attire, juniors were 70s, sophomores were 80s, and freshmen imitated greasers from the 50s. On Thursday, Grand Island High School's school spirit was strong with everyone dressed in blue and white Viking apparel. Finally, the week ended with the grades sporting their class color. Seniors wore pink, juniors wore green, sophomores wore red, and freshmen wore yellow. Friday ended in excitement with the clash of the Vikings, and the seniors were victorious once again. Juniors came in second, the freshmen were third, and sophomores came in last. Ultimately, the spirit week was very successful, being a fun event for the whole school while collecting over a thousand toiletries to donate to local charities and raising awareness about organ donation. This weekend was also full of music. 
with several students performing in all county concerts on Saturday at UB. Congratulations to all the musicians who performed and dedicated their time and energy to this event. Along with this, March has been full of all island concerts. Fortunately, if you missed any of these performances, you can watch the recordings on our school website. Even though we just had an exciting week, there are more events to look forward to. After school on March 30th, GIHS is hosting a job fair from 2.30 to 4 p.m. in the Viking Mall. Make sure to bring a resume and explore the event, which has over 15 local businesses ready to hire. Then after spring break, come to the Health and we Wellness Fair on Wednesday, April 19th, from 5 to 7 p.m. at Grand Island High School. The GICSC Health and Wellness Committee has planned an interactive night for families to participate in and learn about the activities available, and all GI residents are welcome to attend. Spotlighters has also begun rehearsals for the two shows written and directed by senior members. Make sure to come see The Stairs by Kathleen Prozek and Jesse Cam, and The Only One by Maya Nowak on Friday, April 21st at 7 p.m. and Saturday, April 22nd at 3 p.m. Earlier this month, New York State PTA announced the results of the Statewide Reflections Contest. We would like to recognize two GIHS students that earned an award of merit. Congratulations to Reagan Fast and John Paul Cibuleski. Both students received awards for their literature pieces, with Reagan writing about her lifelong struggle to overcome nonverbal autism and invisible me. Likewise, John Paul shared his perspective on the war with Ukraine and his cultural identity as a Ukrainian American, and the Ukrainian voice shall forever endure. Once again, congrats to these excellent students who went above and beyond with these projects. With the last week before the third quarter ends, Students are looking forward to spring break. This week will end with the volleyball tournament in the gym on Friday, and break will start on April 3rd with classes resuming on Tuesday, April 11th. Thank you. That brings us to the correspondence recognition and good news, with um, beginning with Mr. Roth and um, our winter sports. I didn't realize I missed the uh, 50s. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I got plenty of that to wear. Uh, okay, before uh, I recognize um, our two outstanding teams, our boys bowling and girls hockey, we have plenty of individual uh, honors. And uh, first off, I, uh, we have this NFL League Sportsmanship Award, and it's voted on by all the, uh, all the coaches uh, of every sport and an athlete in each sport um, if you're in the Niagara Frontier League. And this uh, winter season, we had three uh, sportsmanship winners. And what they do is honor at the Niagara Fall, the NFL end of the year banquet, and, uh, and they also receive a certificate for the coach and the, the individual or the outstanding athlete. Uh, girls basketball was a winner again and coach Kristen Lager couldn't make it tonight but uh, Claire LeFay, can you please stand up Claire? And Claire, show them how to uh, them they, get, they get a patch for being an outstanding sportsmanship. Thank you Claire. Uh, boys basketball Coach Chris Simpson and Dylan Andrews. Thank you again. And the third one is Boys Bowling. Coach Craig Davis and Talon Newton. Thank you. And hey, Craig, before you uh, sit down, um, I want to call. <laughs> I want to call Craig Davis up here. He has two outstanding bowlers here with him. So come on up, uh, John and uh, Talent. And uh, I just want to say uh, uh, it's hard to explain this season, but it was a really unique and amazing effort by not only these two guys, but the coaching and also the team. So better than me explain it, you explain it. <laughs> If you want to use the mic, go ahead. I thought you wanted me to strike out here with some. <laughs> <laughs> I'll spare them. <laughs> At least I kept it clean and I don't know. Um, so, yes, we, we did have a, a 
a tough year in the league. We finished seven and five, and it seemed like we were just snake bit. We had a great team, and every time we bowled someone, they bowled their best night of the year against us. And we just we, we had some tough losses that probably should have happened. But the highlight of our season definitely came with um, the sectional tournament. The sectional tournament had 42 teams, and we came in third overall and won the Class B championship. So there's four four classes in the, in the 42 teams. We won the Class B. And um, unfortunately, you win Class B, yeah, if you don't win overall, you don't go on to states. So we couldn't go on to states as a team. But the section sends what we call an all-star team. And they take, there's 285 individual bowlers in. And of those 285 individual bowlers, they take six, bowl, the top six bowlers to the New York State Finals. And they bowl as an all-star team for section six. Now you might notice that we have two guys here wearing a nice section six uh, <laughs> jersey here. And, uh, and that's because both of them finished in the top six. Dallin was fourth overall, and John was sixth overall. Now, you might be saying, well, that probably happens all the time. Nope. <laughs> nope. I, uh, I've been coaching for 20 years. I've had two people finish one place away from going to states. This is the first time I've ever had someone make it. And not only did I get one, I got two, which is the first time it's ever happened in school history. So it's really <laughs> Talon before at that board meeting, he, he's the one that threw a 300, he made a 710 split. Later on in the year, he, he threw an 800, and uh, um, that's harder to do than throwing a 300. It's a tough thing to do. I've thrown a 300, and I've never come close to an 800. <laughs> and John, you will probably see up here many more times, because John is a freshman who is just one outstanding bowler. His mom, he, his mom's dead for him. <laughs> Outstanding bowler. He actually finished second in the state for high game with a 279 at the state tournament. Muskingum University, so he's gonna, we're gonna have an official signing, or he's had an official signing. We'll have one made. We'll have another one yes. in for town. All right. Thank Congratulations. You. Well done. I couldn't explain that myself. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even believe an 800 or a 279 other than a 300. Wow. That's, that's impressive. Well, now, for what I consider the best team in Western New York, of course, and possibly the best team in the New York State. And I know they lost at the state's uh, in the uh, final four, but maybe the coach can <laughs> explain it better than me. We were basically playing an all-star team, not another high school or two combined. So, um, Coach Jeff Orlowski, head coach Jeff Orlowski, come on up. Maybe you can explain a little bit about that and maybe recap a little bit of the season. Come on in here. And I, I just want to say thanks to Jeff. Uh, he obviously uh, is in Kenmore. He probably has to do this at his board and uh, Kenton board meeting and maybe even take a trip out to Lockport with our two girls. But uh, he's done an outstanding job over the years. He did an outstanding job this year. He took them as far as I really think we deserve to go. Um, that team is just so good. Jeff? Thank you very much. Um, just to explain what he's talking about, in, in Western New York, um, all the girls' high school teams are combined with other teams because there's just not enough girls to play. So, for example, as you said, we're combined with Kenmore, Grand Island, and, and Lockport. So we cap it with three school districts in Western New York. Um, so that's the most you can have. Um, in the other districts across the state, or the sections, for example, uh, they don't have caps on it. So it becomes a real issue. So what happens, the team we ran into in states, the semifinals, um, had eight high schools on their team. Four of the high schools had one kid from each school. So they went specifically after the, the four kids to, to be able to, to make their team. I joked before we we won our sectional title, I joked with one of the other coaches of the Niagara County team, I said, why don't we just join together and go together and 
go play states because that's really what you're up against. Your multiple districts. It's almost like all-star teams. I've even suggested that we do something like bowling does. Because bowling puts a section six team together, and then the section six goes together. I go, why don't we do that? Because section six would never lose in hockey if we did that. So um, I'm very proud of the girls. Um, I, I want to thank Dr. Graham for driving all the way out to Utica to come see us. Mr. Roth, you've been extra supportive, and all the, the board members and teachers throughout the year have been great. Um, it's been a pretty exciting year. Um, it's the best season ever put together in, in Kenmore hockey. We went 11-0 in our first league game without allowing a goal. Um, some, I mean, it's big. It, you don't say the shutout word after a game, yet alone 11 in a row. Um, so we had a pretty good year there. We went 14-0 and to start the season. Uh, we lost only one game in, in league play. We went 15-1 and in league and 17-1 and overall, um, winning our second ever federation title, which goes to the team with the best record. Um, we clinched the number one seed going into sectionals, and we handily walked through Western New York. We beat the Williamsville four to one. It wasn't even close. Um, it was four to nothing in the second period in the championship game when we beat Niagara County. So it was pretty impressive. We advanced all the way to the final four. We lost to Clinton um, four to two. This is how they scored their goals. Not that I want to be make up excuses for the girls, but uh, in the second period, it's tied 0-0. They get a penalty shot for slashing, which I don't even understand. And the rep would not speak to me. Um, so, and I was very nice. Maybe I should have been yelling. Maybe that's what they're used to out there. I don't yell at officials. For those of you who know me ever, I tell the girls never do it. I've never once yelled at an official and they changed their call, so it's not worth it. But anyway, so they scored on the penalty shot. Then we tie the score up at one, and we're all over them again on a power play we have. And uh, just as the girls getting out of the penalty box, they ice the puck right on the tape. The girl she goes in on a breakaway and scores for their second goal. So we tie it back up at two, and again the refs helped them out. Uh, with a power play with three minutes to go in the game, and we lost with two to go. Um, then the fourth one was an empty netter. So it was a little rough way to end, especially with, with the numbers that we put up this year. Um, we actually beat this team in a shootout in a tournament earlier in the year. Um, you play that team ten times, and we probably win seven or eight of them. I thought we were the better team, and we just didn't make it that day. They went on to destroy the team the next day and win the state title. So it was uh, a, a big thing. We were led this year by our senior captain and league MVP, our goalie, uh, Carolyn Bourgeau, she had .72 goals against average. Um, and she had eight shutouts by herself, 627 minutes, which is a, a, a league record in all of it. We had Maddie Flory with 32 points. Uh, we had five girls in the top 10 in scoring in Western New York. Madison Flory, the Grand Island product, she's outstanding. She's going on to play at, at New England University next year for hockey. Um, she was supposed to be here tonight. Oh, she's here. There she is. There she is over there. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see you over there, Maddie. Um, but we, and our other captain, um, Megan Penzel, who plays defense, doesn't have the stats, but did a fine job because we probably had the best defense in, in Western New York. Um, we had a girl on the first team, which was Maddie. We had two girls on Emilio Casillo and Maddie Marzik on the second team, and Izzy Borgia on the third team of all Western New York. So we're really proud of our accomplishments. Um, we had some kind of cool recognitions throughout the year. Um, one of them was the Sabres every year. They, they bring ask it for jerseys. And they put them all out on a table for every team in Western New York, high school team in Western New York. And the guys come by at the end of one practice and decide what jersey they want to wear. Well, we were kind of lucky because Jeff Skinner opted to wear our jersey. And I have a photo for you, Dr. Graham, of, of him wearing our jersey. And we actually have, he signed it and sent it back to us. So that was kind of cool. So I have that at, at home. But, uh, and not only that, when we were on our way to States, we got an email message. And it was a video call from Jeff um, editing the girls on to, uh, to uh, wish him luck um, that in our big game. So that was kind of cool. It meant a lot to us. But the most impressive thing was what Grand Island did for us before we left. Um, for those of you that don't know, we showed up here at the high school to pick up the girls with the bus, and uh, we walked through the hallways of, of Grand Island, and it was four students deep, all the teachers, every single kid in the school was down these hallways that we walked through. And then we get out back here, and Dr. Graham and, and Dr. Uh, Mr. Roth had, had arranged, I guess, the, the fire department and police department to escort us off the island. We then drove over to the elementary school, and all of the elementary kids, I got a great video of it, all the elementary kids are lined up outside the school, and our girls all got off the bus and high-fived the whole, whole girl, uh, the whole group of kids along the way, which is really cool, uh, really exciting, to the point where just before the game, you know, we're warming up, and one of my players, a Canmore kid now, 
goes, he goes, Mr. O, we can't lose today. I go, well, he could. I go, I hope you don't. He goes, but we have to do it for the people in Grand Island that lined up and, and did that for us. And, you know, it was very touching that they would think that way, that, you know, here they are, it's, you know, they're going for a game that probably the biggest they'll ever play, and they're thinking about what you guys did for us. So we thank you. I can't thank you enough. And what I've done is uh, I've got the game puck, Dr. Graham, I want to give to you from the section championship game. I have written on there, you know, that we won four to nothing. We want to give that to you as well as the the uh, picture of Jeff Skinner. And real quick, I know I'm talking a lot, but I want to recognize the girls now. So, uh, um, our, what our goalies, Ella Johnston, okay, Megan Pinzel, our, our senior captain, is holding the sectional title trophy in her hand. <laughs> we have Tegan Willits, who's a, a sophomore here. Her dad is also a teacher. Oh, you're a freshman, sorry. I'm sorry. I think you're older than you are because she's outstanding. Uh, Ella Jamie next to her is a sophomore. And Natalie Kupp, which is a sophomore next to her. And our star captain over there, um, Maddie Flory. I knew we lose a few of this year's seniors, but I'm guaranteeing a sectional title in a few more years. <laughs> the majority of our team is sophomores right now, and to do what they did was great for us at that age. So. Do we have any seniors with us this yes. evening? Yes, Mad we... Madison and Megan are both seniors. Can we hear from them what their plans for sure. our high school can know, or what they're interested in doing? Hey, absolutely. <laughs> 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 Megan, right here. Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, I'm undecided. Um, I'm going to Western New England University in Massachusetts to play D3 hockey, and I'm going for the varsity. Coach, can you just bring the girls up with you and take one picture for this perspective? Everybody has a trophy. It was very exciting following this event and team effort this year and it's a very bright future I'll tell you that just uh, exactly right thanks John uh, last Sunday March 12th no two Sundays ago March 12th was an Niagara Pale banquet uh, an Niagara PAL I should say Police Athletic League um, at the uh, Sheridan Hotel with 13 
other teams or schools, I should say, representing uh, the PAL Awards and their um, and their banquet and everything they do for us. We were invited about 10 years ago as an Erie County school, and now just a year or two ago, uh, the Kenton schools, Ken East and Ken West, were invited. So we're the only three from Erie County. But 13 other schools uh, take part in this PAL. And uh, our GI students came out pretty good that night uh, with awards. Uh, the first uh, award I wanted to mention was they gave out an award for the Unified Athlete Award. And our girl, Savannah Bukowski, is Savannah here by any chance? I, I didn't think so. Okay. Savannah's not here, but she is what an awesome teammate. Uh, she's outstanding achievement for what she does in Unified Bowling and Basketball. Uh, she's got this contagious personality and just a terrific role model, not only for the two teams, but a terrific role model for her classmates. And if you ever get a chance to watch the uh, boys uh, Unified Basketball, which Chris Simpson is back here now coaching, uh, the first game I think is uh, April 25th? 28th. 28? Okay, and uh, how many you play? How many in those uh, Three at home, seven total. Okay, so you gotta come out and watch, uh, and especially, you know, take a look at Savannah, but also the job Chris does with his unified uh, basketball. Uh, but I just had to mention her name because she, she was just lighting up at the bank. Uh, the second award uh, was the Mr. and Mrs. Allen Elia um, Memorial Scholarship Award, is, and it's given to one male and one female out of those 14 high schools. And we had the winner, we've had winners previously, but we had the winner this year as, and it only goes to senior basketball players, I'm sorry, uh, for the male and female. And we had the winner this year, female winner, I should say, Cindy Knight. And Sydney, come on up here and just talk a little bit about it. City night, and I would like to thank you for recognizing me this evening. Tonight, I'm being honored for seeing the Mr. and Mrs. Allen R. Elia Memorial Scholarship. To be considered for the scholarship, I had to be nominated by my coach Wagerson and have high grades. I'm a National Honor Society and a scholar athlete. In order to win the scholarship, I had to be a senior basketball player that exemplifies sportsmanship, fair play, and teamwork. I wrote an essay on how basketball has impacted my life greatly, and I just want to thank you so much for having me here tonight. Very well done. They, they said it's like a minimum of 500 words or something like that, or not that. Yeah, something like that. And the scholarship, uh, Sydney's going to Syracuse, and that'll help at least, uh, well, probably not much. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think about tuitions at this day and age, but uh, $1,250, I think it was, right? Yeah. So congratulations. Very well done. Uh, the, the last award and uh, the night, and it's um, the male prep uh, award and female prep award. And our two athletes are here tonight, and the uh, female prep award goes to Lily Kozlowski. Come on up. <laughs> and the male prep award goes to Eddie Porsche. Before Eddie says a few words, um, I just wanted to say, you know, we always, parents, um, you know, kids at a, a younger age are always talking about, you know, scholarship, scholarship, but it's really, really difficult to get an athletic scholarship, let alone an academic scholarship. But these two, and, and, and kids are saying, you know, in the middle school, I want to play D1, D2, and uh, Mandy said she's playing D3, but that's comparable in hockey to D1. I think Jeff will attest to that. It's unbelievable competition. So a feather in your cap, Mandy. But here's a little girl right here in lacrosse, a three-sport athlete that is going to Canisius College at Division I girls lacrosse. She'll be playing and uh, attending or uh, and getting a scholarship. So congratulations to Lily.
probably uh, the best, well, not probably, he is the best volleyball player in Western New York. Seriously. And uh, Eddie is going to Damon College, Division Two, and they also give scholarships. And uh, he will be playing with, I think you remember uh, when we won 2019, our uh, uh, state, you know, um, <laughs> State, state award and in boys volleyball and uh, state championship, I should say, in uh, boys volleyball. And he'll be playing with Billy Weiber, Weaver, Billy Weaver. So I just wanted to mention that. And uh, Eddie, come on up and say a few words. Hi, my name is Eddie Korzak. And I would just like to thank Mr. Roth and the athletic department for nominating me for the Niagara Pal Male Athlete of the Year. It's a great honor to represent the Great Island School District. I would also like to thank all my coaches and teammates for giving me the opportunity to live out my high school dreams. I would like to thank my entire family for all their love and support. Mom, you can stand up. And they got to run right out. <laughs> blue part teacher, but she still reads for us. Yeah. This, uh, <laughs> I wear blue and white when I'm here. <laughs> Ashley can, uh, feels the same. But <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I appreciate all the parents showing up tonight. It's really nice. And uh, I guess you guys are done. So you're dismissed. Thank Congratulations. You. If you, know, uh, if you know John Paul, he's one of our most outstanding students. Uh, John, I think in the letter that I wrote for you, I wrote something to the effect of, in order to achieve the rank of Eagle Scout, you had to prioritize your time between family, school, and leisure and recreation. But by doing so, you've distinguished yourself as a young man of integrity who's committed to the service of others. The characteristics of Eagle Scout are deeply now woven into the fiber and DNA of your being. You represent the finest in the next generation. Your citizenship, responsibility, morality have convinced me that we are in good hands with people like you. So congratulations on this achievement. And if you take a couple minutes, maybe share with the board and the community uh, just what you had to do to achieve this honor. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Dr. Graham. Members of the school board, administrators, and all others in attendance this evening. My name is John Paul Sobleski, and I am currently a senior here at Grand Island High School and a member of Boy Scout Troop 510 of the Greater Niagara Frontier Council on Grand Island. Thank you for asking me to join you this evening to discuss my, the completion of my Eagle Scout project, as well as achieving my Eagle Scout rank in Boy Scouts. The road to Eagle Scout has been an incredible journey from start to finish. Ever since I first began as a Wolf Cub Scout in September of 2012, while I was in second grade at Hugh Throne Elementary School. Cub Scouts gave me the opportunity to meet new friends, travel to new places, and participate in new activities. I was already collecting the basic tools and setting up the skills that I would need on my road to Eagle without even realizing it. As I continued to participate in scouting activities, I was also learning the very first lessons of maturity as a Boy Scout in the process. Listening, cooperation, resiliency, and leadership, just to name a few. While I was learning to tie a new knot, pitch a tent, light a fire, or patch a wound, I was also discovering how to grow as a scout, a son, a friend, and a student. I have tried to live by the Scout Oath and the Scout Law because having a commitment to their principles means having the integrity and courage to always do what is right and expected. I 
have completed my Eagle Scout project at St. Nicholas Ukrainian Catholic Parish in Buffalo, which recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. My mom and I are parishioners there. Every Saturday, I serve as head acolyte during the liturgies, and we are also very active members of the Buffalo Ukrainian community. Many of us have family in Ukraine, and with the war still raging overseas, that feeling of heartache and uncertainty compelled me to focus my Eagle Scout project on something that would benefit my fellow Ukrainians here at home. Last July, I successfully planned, prepared, and led a group of scouts in refurbishing the three main entryway staircases leading into St. Nicholas Ukrainian Catholic Church. We spent hours scraping, repairing, and repainting the surfaces of the steps and railings that had not been attended to in years. I also added slip-resistant strips to each of the steps, as our parish has many elderly parishioners, and the Buffalo winners tend to make the stairways quite slippery. Under my guidance, and of the guidance of my scoutmaster, and with the help of several scouts for my troop, I was able to successfully complete my Eagle Scout project over the course of two weeks. Our pastor and my fellow parishioners were quite appreciative of our efforts, and the church steps received a much needed facelift. While I passed my Eagle Board of Review on September 1, 2022, it took several months to receive my Eagle Scout certificate and membership card from the Boy Scouts of America at the national level. As a result, I only recently celebrated my Eagle Court of Honor ceremony on Saturday, March 18th. Becoming an Eagle Scout is not just about climbing to the precipice of scouting or adulthood, but rather, it is a way of life based on principles, integrity, and leadership. It requires learning how to serve others by example, and striving to make a positive impact in the world around us. After all, an Eagle Scout is someone who is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Earning the Eagle rank in Scouting is truly an incredible honor, and one that I hope to be continually worthy of throughout my life doing my best by obeying the Scout Law, by helping others at all times, and by keeping myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Thank you again for having me join you here this evening to be recognized for my Eagle Scout accomplishment. Can we get a picture? Session and 
is it is for agenda items only, and we do have uh, one um, individual that signed up signed up for Rebecca Dolan. My name is Rebecca Dolan, and this is a game motto. We are here to ask you for your support to start Girls Flag Football at Grand Island. I played varsity soccer, basketball, and lacrosse this year as a freshman, but I've always wanted to play football. I feel that girls at Grand Island deserve a chance to play a sport that boys have always had. I have collected about 40 signatures of other girls to support this request. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. Thank you. to curriculum and instruction with Mr. Loria. Good evening, everyone. I just have one agenda item on our agenda for curriculum in the form of action item. This is for our overnight field trip for the 2023-2024 school year to France and Belgium. And I'm asking for the board to approve this field trip for our students. If I could have a motion, please. Motion. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. And that's the event. Okay. Moving on to personnel instructional. If I could have a motion to approve uh, PI 1 through PI 4, please. A motion. And a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. That brings us to personnel non instructional. If I could have a motion to approve PNI 1A through D, please. I have a motion. And a second? All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. Any introductions tonight? Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to finance with Dr. Harris. Okay, so everything on the agenda tonight is just informational. Um, item A is the check warrant for February. Um, item B is COVID funds information. It goes back to 2020 when we first started receiving funds all the way through the receipt of American Rescue Funds and how we had spent those. So there are a couple different um, attachments. I won't go into each one of them, but it really outlines the application process we had to go through to submit to utilize these funds with the state, as well as the website where all of our information for American Rescue has to be um, not only published there, but updated each year for the public to know um, how we spent funds, what we're spending them on, and what we plan to do for the upcoming year. So that will be updated again uh, in the summer. I will do a, another, another survey send out because you have to still receive input. Um, so I plan to do that probably uh, middle to end of May, and then we'll update that on the website as well. Um, C is the Rev track and self-funded um, medical bank reconciliation information, and then I guess we are ready to start budget unless there are questions on the other items. Do you want her to do her stuff before we do budget? Um, we can do special education. Okay. Are there any questions? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I did not have any. So we just need a motion for A then. A motion for A, please. Okay, if I could have a motion for uh, special education people, personnel services, A, please. A motion. And a second? A second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. Thank you. Okay. Now we're ready for the budget. Right. <laughs> Third budget okay. presentation. I want to thank the board and all of our administrators <clears throat> for working so diligently on the budget. Uh, tonight, we're going to try to feature any slide that has an update. So for those board members, you, you know that many of these slides are a little redundant because they've been presented to you 
each um, each time that we've done the, the budget presentation, but again, we'll focus on anything that is new, just to be expedient with our time today. Uh, here, um, just want to mention, obviously, we're going to go through many items on the budget. Uh, one note is that although it's not listed here, actually it is under budget calendar, we do have a special board meeting April scheduled for April 11th. It's a Tuesday. Correct. And it's designed uh, to the extent uh, that the governor has uh, submitted her budget officially. Uh, her deadline is usually April 1st. Sometimes it's a little late, maybe for a first-time governor, but we hope that it's on time. April 1st is a Saturday. 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 So we're thinking like Monday, maybe Tuesday, yeah. but Monday is my hope. All right. So Ruby and I will be paying very close attention to that, and and at that point we will communicate with the board if there are surprises or changes with right. the monies that have already been allocated to the district. So I'm going to jump ahead. You've seen a lot of these enrollment slides in the past, but I am going to stop here. Uh, as you know, we do. This is how we look at projected numbers for kindergarten. This is a chart that shows us the live birth data attributed to Grand Island from five years ago. There's an arrow here that points to their prediction of 187 students uh, enrolling in September. And just to make sure our board is aware. Uh, we are predicting 210. So in the event that the previous chart is more accurate, uh, I want the board to know that uh, as you've seen in the past, we're recommending an increase in the number of teachers uh, working at Kegabine from 17 to 18, and that is shown here. Uh, we will be paying attention to kindergarten enrollment. And in the event that this number looks like it's going to be close to the previous slide, we will look for a transfer of a teacher from Sidway to Kegabine to increase the number of teachers to 18. In the event that this number is more accurate and we look to have 210 uh, students enroll in kindergarten with 11 classroom teachers, we will not transfer that teacher, but we will hire a brand new teacher. Uh, to make up the difference. We just think it's prudent to wait and to watch enrollment and make that adjustment in the summer when we, when we see the need to transfer or to hire. Does the board have any questions about that? I, I had a question just about youth. I know we had, last year we had a large, I think it was a second grade class. I'm just looking at the, the small. And then, um, did you say youth? I think it was it was youth. We had a, a larger second grade class, and then in third grade, it seems like we did we lower the number of students to teachers. Did we lose any students? I guess at that all oh, that we had that we had the um, uh, we it seemed like we had more teachers that year at youth than at the second grade level that are not um, moving to third degree. We have more teachers this year at second grade than we will next year at third grade. Just yeah, it's a good question. So uh, this is the projected elementary class size starting in September for youth. So we're looking at 120 students coming out of Sidway from the first grade to go to youth with six teachers and class size of 20. We're looking at 94 students in third grade with four teachers and a class size of 23, closer to 24. 134 teachers at fourth grade with six teachers, class size of 22. And at fifth grade, 81 students, four teachers, and class size of 20. So overall, for the building, we're looking at 21, you know, 21.4 or 5, uh, or 22 students as class size for youth starting in September. So that would be 22 students? Uh, right here is the average class size ratio, which is 21.4. And then these are the class size ratios for second, third, fourth, and fifth So third is 22 students? 23. 23. And what is it? What is it this year? It's like, do we know what it is this year in second grade? Is it? This slide, is that? Uh, I can see. That slide in this document. 
yes, if right. you go back to slide 16, I believe. Yes, that's the current. So actually, here's the slide. So the total number of teachers are, is not changing. There's 20 classroom teachers attributed to second, third, fourth, and fifth. But how they're deployed uh, makes a difference to the class size. So these these 20 teachers will be reshuffled a little bit, maybe just a little bit. Uh, to accommodate the needs that we're projecting for uh, this year. So the area of projected numbers. It's still 20 teachers for the building, and the class sizes are here. So second year is like 22. I think this year, yeah, second grade, grade is, was 18, 18. class size of 18, and now third grade. Yeah, second to third, so it's the same class size of second So as we move along, uh, nine teachers will be uh, recommended for sixth grade at the middle school. So here's the, the nine that will be attributed to sixth grade. Uh, the retirements still are being replaced and that recommendation will continue. Will be any changes to the proposed budget, I guess, with the gap now, right? Yes, so um, as we go through, um, I'll go over a couple of things. The budget to budget rollover is closed, so there is not a gap there. These, this is the gap with the new request um, of items that we're still reviewing. So just for new board, new board members or any of our veteran board members, this is the work that the board and our administrators and supervisors really take extremely seriously. I can tell you that Ruby had uh, scheduled a meeting just a short while ago with many of our administrators to scrub the BOCES budget. I think in that meeting we did find $50,000 that we, we could remove from yes. the BOCES budget, which we were happy yes. to. And so, uh, as that work continues, and also we're waiting to see what the governor is going to give us, uh, then we, our goal is at the next budget presentation, that that 398,225 gap is down to zero. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have questions about that? It's the 50,000. That's with the 50, so um, the 50000 was used to close the uh, revenue and expenditure lines, and then the uh, new requests are all the new items, and we will touch on those as well as um, other requests that are still present, and federal funds will be used. So it, it's a combination of both. Would be anything new on this slide? Um, no. No, no uh, updates, just I think the only thing we have is the components of what the uh, houses offered for uh, the city, what are for the Senate, and their thoughts on the different things that were being uh, proposed as well as the assembly. So we're just waiting for all of that to trickle up. Absolutely. I think the most important element here is this carve out. It's, uh, was called uh, high impact tutoring set aside. This was the first time that we've seen um, the budget restrict the use of, of certain dollars. I shouldn't say the first time because many of these things like UPK is restricted and so forth. But this was another carve out to foundation aid. Uh, superintendents and others across the state have been pushing back on this carve out. Uh, we hope that in the next iteration of the approved budget by the governor that these dollars are just uh, absorbed into the regular foundation aid without any uh, you know any specific directions on how to spend those dollars correct what is that so i couldn't hear you so the whole thing, yeah so the whole thing is i don't really know what i'm saying but i like she just wanted to know when is it like when would we know so we definitely will know by april 11th yeah, so the question I think you're asking is, on April 11th, will we know? We will know. 
Yes. We do anticipate that efforts uh, to stop um, legislators from telling us what to do with certain knowledge, we expect that to, to be approved by the governor, but we can't say that for certain today. So when the, the governor's deadline is April 1st to propose and adopt her budget, sometimes new governors may take a few extra days to get that done. Oh. So we're going to be waiting very carefully, watching our phones and <laughs> information on April 1st and April 2nd and April 3rd until we get the brand new, like the, the, the final, the, the final budget. Yes. Okay. And the concern is once they start doing things like this, you can that it's going to be something else yeah. next year. Well, and and the there's a lot of language with this, right? So the set aside was very specific for the 23-24 school year. So there's a question of why are you doing it specifically like this? Is it something that's going to go away the year after? And given the allowances for the funds, it really gridlocks you with adding um, either a, a robust program because it's 208000 or increasing staff. So that's the, always the question thereafter is, are you going to continue to give us these funds to support this? Are you not? Um, is it going to roll into foundation aid in the future? Is it not? Like, there's just a lot of unknowns. So I think the push um, from superintendents, from business officials, from the uh, Senate Assembly is really put the funds in foundation aid so it's not this back and forth question year by year of what you want to use these for or not. So Ruby, I mean, there really weren't any changes. No, but if you scroll down um, a little bit, no, no, okay. So um, there, due to the increase of foundation aid, there is a requirement, uh, it actually started in the 21-22 uh, school year, for school districts to provide a foundation aid survey. Our increase in the past, though, last year it was a million, um, did not hit the threshold of providing the survey. This year, planning for next year, it did. So we sent the survey out to parents, students, staff, uh, every, everyone, <laughs> anyone could really go on and complete the survey, and we received uh, those results, so that is also included in this presentation. Do you right. want me to talk to this, or do you want yeah. to talk to no, it? go ahead. It, and I think just overall, um, how many people responded? We had 309 um, responses. This does break it down into um, parents uh, being about 59%. Um, student responses were nice as well. Uh, they are around 28%. Teachers, 15 uh, And administrators, zero. That's probably because they give me their res responses in person. Um, support personnel was 2.3%. And we did have community and other groups. So um, what you will see here is the percentage of people that responded yes of the 309 responses and what they were responding yes to. Um, these areas were not areas that I specifically picked to ask questions. These are the specific questions the state asked once we submit our information so we did reach out to the community that are very specific on the areas. So that's how we uh, created our question selection. And you could have picked every one of them, right? Yes, there was not a just select one. So you do have, there were responses, and this is just being very honest and transparent, where people selected everything, and then you had other people who were very specific um, in what they wanted to select, and then the next page actually uh, shows a compilation of write-in responses where they were able to type them. Um, because people filling out the survey had to give their name and email addresses to people to turn people I was I, I, I was I surprised to you give your name I, I thought you did because I, I I went through it I was I think you and I could be wrong maybe it's just an email address but I'm just wondering if there's thoughts on and, and maybe a lot I would check that um, I don't remember the name part uh, I did do a couple of surveys, so it wasn't a non but I did look at it. I was just curious. I would, I would hope it would not 
to tear some more from um, just leaving it. Just all you were required to do was give the email, and it just says valid email, and that's it. And it, it, that could bother people. I, on my, our end, we're just trying to make sure the same person isn't filling out. Oh, I know. I three times. And I can honestly tell you, I couldn't tell you one email address that responded. I went all the way over, and I just wanted to collect the data. So the ones that you got. Others. You didn't add those in at all. No, every every this is no this is every single response was recorded. Other was the opportunity in here if you were saying I don't fit into these boxes and I'm still completing the survey. Everybody's information was uh, collected and recorded in here. And then what I did for the actual typed in responses is I grouped them based on like the similarity of the category because some of them were literally like a paragraph long and I wasn't going to um, type that in here <laughs> but I did uh, group similar items and then I was able to create that uh, chart to show. Right, but you didn't add like the social emotional for all of that 16, that's not included, like those are separate, right? Say that again? You know how like number one is like uh, student social emotional health on the first page, yeah. The 84.5%. Yeah, yeah. And then you know how it says on the second one, mental health, social emotional health for all. Those are two separate. Right? Those are, you could have said, check the box of mental health. Right. Then you could have in this side box repeated, I think your focus should be mental health, and you were counted in both categories. Because what I didn't want to do is take out 20 people typing in or 30 people typing in, I really believe you should focus on reducing class size and sit and present that to the board knowing that people took time to complete the survey and they typed in a response. So I included their typed in component because I wanted to show full transparency outside of clicking. They took time to write in a response that was focused on athletics. Um, I think you should provide free meals for students, like all of those things. So that's how I did it. So it's, it's included in the percentage, and then if they wrote something specifically in the box, it is shown on the second um, chart. Okay. I, I just thought it showed how important they felt it was to yeah, make sure it was addressed yeah. twice. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anything new here? Yes. All right. So um, I had the pleasure of meeting with Dr. Graham um, last week, and we had a gap around $400,000 in the rollover, and I walked away and I was looking at my secretary and I said, well, I don't know where he thinks I'm going to find $400,000. And uh, I was very grateful that I went back and just reviewed some of the slides and the math components in the background of building um, the formulas in here. And I did find $400,000, $405,000 to be exact. So I was actually really excited about that. So what I have shown here just as a help aid for myself, but also for the board, um, is the aid area and the amount. So you have the total aid that was forecasted, which will match to these couple slides ago, of the state budget. And then you will see deductions. And the reason why there are deductions here is because building aid is shown in a different area, so I just show that. Um, BOCES deduction, even though they're saying we're going to get 1.6, we never received the full amount of BOCES aid. So I just backed those components out to align with the state aid number you see up top. I found myself uh, deducting UPK twice. I deducted the whole amount, and then I deducted the $405,000 increase. So that was how I got to that. But I just wanted to show that because that is a difference um, from what you saw at the last presentation. Any questions with that? This slide is still similar? Similar in title, um, slight differences pertaining to updates. Um, and that would be, like Dr. Graham mentioned, um, we did review the BOCES budget, 
So there were reductions that happened there. Um, there were some additional conversation in reference to uh, salaries, positions that are this year, um, temporarily things that are happening next year. And so all of those things were taken into consideration to just correct the information as we scrub the data in each presentation. That then flows over into the uh, more detailed chart that goes department by department. So you'll see on this the BOCES um, line item change, the salary line item uh, was adjusted slightly, and I feel like uh, possibly central administration, if I did a comparison of the two, um, was also slightly adjusted. And through those um, area, you will see the total appropriation increase, which is so small on the screen, but I'm refusing that I need glasses. Um, the total appropriation increase was 3.5 million, and then the uh, total revenue increase was 3.5 million, which brings you to a budget gap for rolling it over um, of zero. Clearly, that's good news. So oh, you. yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's looking like, I don't know where you can sit. Just have that stored away. But. So as we look at uh, the wants and some of the needs, you can see that increasing part from 0.4 to 0.5, I think previously it said 0.8. Correct. Correct. So now it's 0.5. So just uh, it's a slight increase of $8,000 for that art position. I'm talking to Hillary that will allow this part-time uh, art teacher to be able to cover some classes that are needed based on the new um, recommendations or the new requests from students. Additionally, a slight increase dropping the um, teaching assistant portion that's connected to this 0.5 English, 0.5 teaching assistant, and just uh, increasing it by 16,000 to make it a one FTE English teacher will give more flexibility at the high school uh, to accommodate the needs of the students, particularly uh, some of the newer students in the, in the bubble coming out of eighth grade. But it's just a slight increase. With middle school, uh, we're still under consideration as a slight increase for the web coordinator stipend. Scroll down slowly. In Kegabine, we do know that uh, the Kegabine needs an additional teacher. I explained earlier how that will be take a look at over the summer with uh, enrollment of kindergarten at Sidway. So this number could change. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, um, where everybody where everybody belongs. belongs. Yeah. So that's a, a special orientation called web where everybody belongs, where new students come from fifth grade to sixth grade are part of an induction and an orientation, but beyond the one day element, uh, it's it's throughout the entire school year that eighth grade students who mentor uh, young sixth grade students, there are activities throughout the whole year that requires quite a bit of planning uh, and uh, to, to uh, compensate the two teachers who work all year with that program, uh, the principals recommending this increase. Yeah, and I look at it as, Thank you. Like, if you think about stipends for um, coaches, they work with what, like 30, 35 kids for three or four months. These guys work with 200 kids or more all year long. And, the, and the, web, the web program is really an entire uh, middle school program. So be, besides the eighth graders mentoring the sixth graders, seventh graders and everybody in the school do special activities that are built around social emotional learning yeah. throughout the entire school. So it's pretty comprehensive and quite honestly, uh, we believe that the program that we're running is a model program for Western New York and perhaps the state. And we expect, not that we expect, but we're, we believe there may be some accolades coming to those teachers on a more statewide or national level. Yeah, they're doing, they're doing an amazing job. So that's, those are the requests. I think this number might change if we're uh, able to shift the teacher from CPA to Tech 9. 
Additionally, you'll see community relations change of $4,000, taking this from a 0.5 to a 0.6 FTE. The school resource, resource officer request is still on this budget presentation, which would be an additional 50,000, taking a one FTE and creating a two FTE program, and starting to move toward a more proactive approach for school resource officers having school resource officers doing more in the library, reading to kids, doing more at the secondary level, and classes in criminal justice and so forth. So right now, with, with one part-time police officer in the, on campus for all buildings um, each day, when I say part-time, it's a full day, but that day is split between two people, uh, meaning uh, one person at work, one Wednesday, Friday, the other person might work, Tuesday, Thursday. This would give us more flexibility for safety across the district. Are there any questions about community relations or school resource officer? Additionally, the request for, which was presented to the board at the last budget presentation of the Chief Data Protection Security and Compliance Officer that's still on uh, as a request for the district. This 118000 is not the salary. Uh, it is salary and benefits all uh, put together uh, to show the board the entire true cost. Uh, today we heard from students who came and spoke about flag football for our female students. That is still on uh, the budget request. Upwards of a $15,000 requested. Doesn't mean that it will be a true spend of $15,000, but just taking into account uh, material supplies, referees, transportation, and equipment, it could be up to $15,000. Mm -hmm. uh, this is restorative practices uh, training, which is still here and zeroed out because I think it's an appropriate grant. Yes, Title IV um, grant funds. Uh, and you'll, you will find that as we go through some of these, that they are still included, but we had a discussion whether it be in the area of um, Mike who oversees the title grants or the review that I will talk about a little bit further uh, in the presentation for um, American, it's all still in here, um, in reference to American Rescue and where that stands um, to allow for it. Also, um the high school would like to begin its own freshman transition specialized program. Uh, earlier, there was a, a dollar value attributed to this, but now it's incorporated in a grant. Yes. What is that? The dollar value? No. The it, it'll be if it's approved, it'll be developed by the administration, and it'll, it'll have a similar feel to web. Mm -hmm. It may not be called web. Nice. Yeah. So I see under future um, consideration uh, change smart boards to clear touch screens at Heathrow because 17 TVs at 30,000. I see it's for future consideration. Are, is it safe to assume that the smart boards that are in the classrooms are operational and they can use them? But we're not leaving them with on operational equipment then? And then. Um, I guess with those and the curtains for huge and the pearl risers, um, are those things we could incorporate into a capital project if that yes, if there came up before? That's a good question. So if there I'm is just curious. No, it can. Um, the, the only reason why I looked a little funny as I'm thinking it through my head is um, it can definitely be incorporated in capital project work. It does not mean it is something that the state will say it's aided, okay, but yep. it would be incorporated in all of the uh, configured dollar amounts. Yes, okay. that and, and a lot of other uh, requests on here. No, I, I know there's a lot of them. I was just curious, and I just wanted to make sure that we weren't leaving class, which I was pretty sure the answer was going to be yes, but I just wanted to clarify that we weren't leaving. I have a couple questions before you on. Do we have the numbers for the art? We talked about last time with the art um, numbers of yes. 
and what are the numbers? I don't think we have them specifically, but I believe we do have them at the table. Um, I don't believe that we have at the table what we do when we do our numbers for, for the art enrollment. I'm not recalling the actual request. It was a request to have exact numbers. To look yeah. at increasing from, we're increasing the position from part time to part time, yeah. so we have to look at our Yeah, so Hillary and I sat down on Friday actually, we looked at all of our numbers, not just, and we actually could then went into a master schedule training as well, but we looked at our numbers. And as part of the decision in terms of what you're looking for with the reduction for funding, it was I think a conversation where the numbers look a little bit smaller than we had anticipated in looking at the scheduling. Um, art is a little tricky because art is some is a, is a special area. A lot of times, some of our students will initially opt into an area and they may not get their first choice. And then a lot of times, sometimes kids. Will, but the art numbers were and low enough that we felt confident that we could absorb that with the point six instead of the point eight. Close to the final and drop data. I received an email that we look at our schedule. Yeah. I think that, that I mean, the, the deadline for add drop is soon. It's, it's, yes, because we, we're starting scheduling. So the requests right. are entered, and the requests can still be adjusted. It's usually until we, sometime in April, maybe in May. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then one, Taylor's not me, so yeah. And then once yeah. that happens, there's an additional um, drop add period when the schedule is run yes. till the week. We, of school starting, I believe, and you think it's like the second day, I think it's a couple of days ago. So they'll have another opportunity as well. But those changes are much much less. Correct. Well, we have the bulk of it now because all just by this. Right. And I can provide just like some uh, information so I was able to pull up the art numbers uh, on my computer. So to give you an example, well, first of all, just to make sure we're, that I'm properly communicating, we're looking at now uh, an art teacher who's 0.4 going to a point five. So it's an increase of eight thousand uh, dollars. to support that request, to give you an example, uh, studio art. This year we had 73 students enrolled. Next year we have a hundred students requesting to take studio art. Uh, advanced placement or AP advanced studio art uh, is moving from three students to four students. Um, digital Photography is moving from 26 to 33 students. Uh, now, ceramics had a decrease of 35 to 21. Uh, there were more students that requested textiles. Last year it was not applicable, or this year is not applicable. Next year we have 18 students uh, choosing or asking for textiles. Uh, the numbers went down a little bit in sculpture from 21 to 13. We went down in film from 23 to 7. Wasn't anybody choosing fashion design? They went up for drawing and painting from 32 to 44, and uh, I think that basically covers it. So, so there definitely is there are more requests than we were accommodating this year. Um, so we think that moving from 0.4 to 0.5 should be appropriate. One one of the classes fashion design is one that's offered every other year with our advertising on the opposite right. sides. So we sometimes see some more requests for numbers that we'll trying to get creative in alternate years or, um, you know, not ideally combining electives, but in some cases, you know, alternating them like this. Right. Okay, I just had one more question about the special ed teacher for k moving to future consideration. I'm wondering what are the um, number of special ed students we have at uh, k Divine and how many teachers do we have? And then how is that, is that comparable to you, to Hughes Elementary? Yeah. Um, so we have, do you want to co I don't have the number of students. Um, Ashley, I can actually get that for you, but I can tell you that um, we have at Hughes, we have second, third, fourth, and fifth grade special ed teacher with um, one self-contained teacher. It's actually a 611. And then at Kegabine, we have um, one less co-teach teacher, and we have two self-contained rooms over at Kegabine, a 2-3-12-1-1 and a 4-5-12-1-1. Okay, so you have three um, at Kegabine, you have three co-teachers, 
three co teachers who yep, and two self contained and at Q's we have so four co teachers and one self contained. So five special teachers in each building? Correct. So that would be the same next year even with the one if the one special ed teacher under K Divine that's moving to future consideration, that would be the same five in each building? Correct. Five for next year. Teachers. And how many so do we know how many students are enrolled? How many special ed students we have that have IPs in Q in K Divine? Is that similar as well as the number of the teachers that we have. Yes. Is that right? Thank you. No, I, I, I will qualify this, and Cheryl. This does not. This chart does not show the number of students. This just shows the number of FTEs, whether they're Gen Ed teachers, Special Ed teachers, AIS teachers, and so forth, attributed to each building. So, and then Cheryl, I don't, I don't know if you're able to pull up the actual number of students, but I don't you know, have the actual numbers here. Can we get the number of students? Yes. Or I just want to make sure. With five and five, it's it's an even split, which is great. Just to make sure the caseload of students is comparable to the number of teachers before we permanently put that off in the future consideration. The nice thing about this chart is that it shows the general education classroom teachers that are attributed to each building, the special education teachers attributed to each building, whether it's consultant teacher, co-teacher, self-contained. It also includes AIS reading, AIS math, uh, teaching assistance used in gen ed classrooms for co-teaching or special ed support, teaching assistance used for AIS support, total faculty, total students, special ed and gen ed, including self-contained. And then what this does is it takes the total number of FTEs with the total number of students, and it shows that at Sidway, if you looked generally speaking, and all of the staff helping kids, the ratio is one FTE to 13.4, and at Huth it's one FTE to 13.3, and at Kegelbein it's one FTE to 12.6. And as we know, at Kegelbein is our Title one school, so you would want to see that number be lower than other schools. So, so that, that helps, but this doesn't happen. Yeah. I did. I did. I did. I did. Okay. Um, so if you're looking at um, seventh grade um, at youth next year, um, we're looking at um, three, potentially four students. Um, and, and, uh, I'm sorry, six, um, possibly seven each at youth. Um, at third grade, we are looking at one, two, three, four, possibly five. Um, in fourth grade, We have eight. I actually was doing projections today. Um, and in fifth grade, we have seven. And in the 611 class, we have seven, seven students. So how many total at Keith? Yeah, I didn't Cheryl, you could put this together. Yeah, I'll put it together. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. okay. I do have it in front of me, so. Okay, I will put the total numbers together. And I'll send it out tomorrow. Thank you. Ashley, it's close to night. Is it okay if we dismiss yep. the students? Yeah, we'll just talk about it. Yeah, yeah. If any student need, needs to leave because it's of your driving restrictions, you can come up and get your paper signed for participation. Mm -hmm. I just want to note that some of the
right. Thank you, Ms. Van Stelling. We're good. Hillary is there. She's got Hillary. Uh, yep. Yeah, I have a quick question. Sure. About um, the response to the Christmas tree and the practices. So, as far as you know, the surveys are looking at more of the social emotional learning, right? And I know restorative practices is a good program, um, but I don't know if it's if it has the same considerations that other You know what, I, I'm finished. I guess I guess where I was going was is I am sure that our administration has looked at everything as a whole. And um, I know restorative practices has been something we've been discussing for a long, long time. And even at our, I believe at our wellness meeting back, meeting back in November, there was a few comments on our uh, restorative at that time as well. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I was at the November meeting and they did talk about restorative training but I think a lot of times when we're focused on social emotional and learning about coping skills, and just a lot, like, I love the past program that we're having at, um, there's just other programs that are just more comprehensive, um, and they're focused on social emotional So I was just wondering if you could help. Sure, sure. So I, I do want to, you know, give a lot of credit to Hillary Kretz Harvey in, in 2019. When she first started as an uh, assistant principal, she worked with Mike Gloria to talk about providing uh, professional development for the high school. To, to that end, uh, not only was she able to do some of that before COVID in 2020, but we were working with other school districts who came for the training besides our own district. So it was pretty, it was pretty exciting to see the regionalness of this concept. There are two elements to the restorative circles. Uh, one element is purely built around social emotional learning that has nothing to do with restorative practices. Okay? And I would just, I brought up this, um, I brought up our website because uh, the high school did a podcast with me. Um, so right here, this podcast called Building a Respectful High School Community is not about restorative practices but it's about using the circle, um, the circle uh, activity prior to teaching to help uh, uh, help students have a, a respectful um, community where everybody respects everybody. Okay. Not only that, but Mr. Nakula just uh, recorded a podcast where at his school they're using social circles or the kids call them sport goals. And so I would just encourage anybody that's interested in, in, in learning about the, the, the pre-work, the proactive work of circles in classrooms that do address social emotional learning because they're not restorative. It's not like a concept of I just feel like we're focused on that. No, it's not. However, there's another component where kids can come together and do a restorative mediation if there's conflict. But set that aside in the, in the parking lot. The real meat and potatoes of the work is done in the classroom before there's a conflict. And it's done in, at the elementary, in the middle, in the high school. But it's a journey. It's going to take a long time for this to become a, a practice every day. So it's a good program. It's definitely, if you get a chance to listen to those two podcasts, 
Um, and if anybody here in the board or the community has questions, I know we can direct you to the right person to answer them. Okay. Can I sure. just add one thing to that? Because um, we have now trained two cohorts of restorative and restorative practices, and our first cohort was, as Brian said, split between us and another district, so we really only had like, 10 to 12 teachers that were trained in there. Our second one was really focused on our mental health workers, our social workers, our administrators, and so this one, would, the next one would be a focus on our teaching staff. Um, we actually have one planned for this June, which is on our title grants that we planned for last year. So the title grants actually run from through the summer to the next year, so it's, it's more of September to August running. So we actually have accounted for that last year's budget, and this would be to hopefully have another core. But we're going to monitor and see how many people are interested in this summer, because if not, not that people are interested in this summer, we might not even use it for that. We also always could go back and rethink what that designated money could be used for for social emotional learning. But it is targeted for social emotional stuff. Right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would encourage anybody to listen to Max's podcast from last week because he had three fourth graders yeah. and in their own words talked about the power of what they call squircles because it's a square and a circle where they said it's kind of funny. But when you listen to their own words, uh, it, it, I think it'll actually answer your question and how powerful that social emotional learning is. Yeah, so it's it's definitely uh, something to that we're proud of, and it's kind of cool that we have kids speaking in their own voice and sharing their perspective. Shirley, you have something to share? Yes. Um, so at Youth, we have 33 special education students, 26 in a co-teach, seven in a self-contained, and a kegabine. We have 37, 23 co-teach, but we have 14 self-contained, which is why we have the two self-contained rooms over at Kegbine. These are all very good questions. We definitely appreciate the board asking important questions as we build this budget. Just waiting, Ashley, if you want to want me to go on or just wait? Okay. So I think we covered all the elements on this slide. Uh, next slide, I can I see that we have uh, some needs. Uh, Ruby, I don't know if you want to <laughs> chat a little bit about some of this equipment. Yes, so um, in a future slide, I think it's like two or three slides from here. Um, I show the American Rescue Funds and where we currently stand with the spending, where I anticipate the 22-23 year to end, and then what I'm anticipating for the 23-24 um, school year. So through that review, there were two items on here, um, which was, I'm just making sure I'm mentioning the correct ones, um, the tech department, uh, equipment replacement plan, as well as the PE Fitness Center. So I was able to take the first year of those replacement plans and put them within um, American Rescue funds. That allows really two things. Um, number one, if, if and when, um, the board approves and then the community votes and says, this is good to go, we can actually start that purchasing process, at least for PE, because that's the entire amount they need earlier. So the hope would be that we can get some of these things implemented and when students are actually coming back to school in September, those items will be here. Um, and that's just based on lead time, possible lead time of purchasing equipment. Everything has a really long lead time. So because it is federal funds, because the funds for um, American Rescue and all of the COVID funds are really the only grant that has ever just run over from year to year to year. Um, most grants, has they have an end date, you submit a new application, you wait for approval process, you move forward. That's not how these work. Um, it's just to allow for people to spend the funds um, timely. So that would allow for those two, with the understanding though, that there was a five-year plan, right? 
So you will see the request again, and if it is going to move forward in the future, it would be a general fund component because the, the grants go away. So I do just want to be very transparent, and I think these are great things to fund. I think we definitely need to do stuff with PE, but you will see the request again in the future to continue the plan forward. So this is just so, year one? Of yes. Gotcha. First year American Rescue grant funds, that's why I just said first year. Well, no, on the fitness, the five year fitness center plan. This is the fund. Year, year one. Yeah. Yes. Now, another thing, um, and th this is the area that is always difficult. I anticipate staff costing a certain dollar amount, right? We take their salary, we put them in the grant for an expense. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, people can transition to other jobs. Uh, people can go on an unpaid leave, right? Or uh, funds can be set aside where we do uh, summer school is a perfect example. I may think summer school may cost 80000 It may come in at 60000 I, I never really know that until that program runs. So what will occur at least at the end of the summer is I'll do a review of summer school to see where that stands. Um, if we don't spend it all, could it be allocated to assisting with an additional component of PE or other? Yes. And then the same thing would be done again as you get closer to the end of the grant or planning year um, to see if we can spend down the funds because that's the goal to, to do a max spend of the funds. This American Rescue, we had to allocate every dollar. Right? Correct. So now we have this money for these two programs. What have we removed that we originally thought we were going to use the funds for when we first had to get the report? Great question. So I would not say we have specifically removed anything. Yes, I did. So what occurred was through the review process, um, when we originally planned with Amer planned for the utilization of American Rescue Funds, there were summer programs that we planned K-12 for the entire three years of the funds. We did the summer school program um, yes. Oh, I thought you were saying. No, no. Give you a minute. Um, we did the summer school program year one. Um, I think by year two there was not, or it didn't seem as if there was enough traction or interest. In that, outside of just budgeting for the teaching staff, we budgeted for transportation costs. So when that fell away, that allowed for additional funds to be available. So even though we may have picked up other things in the midst of that. Um, I know that there, through contract negotiations, there was some shuffling that we did um, for a uh, retention site. Thank you. And um, so we did those movements, as the board knows. But um, this is after reviewing all of those areas, um, which I go into a little bit more detail in the future slides. But it's just simply me taking what we've spent in year one and what I anticipate for year two and then comparing it to what I thought we were going to spend in those years. In those years. So this coming summer, will that be our third year for the summer school program or the second year? It will be the so, third. So we lost traction in year two. So are we budgeted for year three? to the amount where we were in year one, or did we reduce it because we had less traction, right? So what if what if we go into year three, right, and go back to where we were in year one? Do we have the funds available? I mean, those summer school programs were designed and were excellent, right? And I would hope that if it you know, regains traction, that we will see the money for those students in summer school. So there are, Let's go back a little bit because I want to make sure we're identifying the summer programs, um, even with Cheryl over here asking questions. So there were multiple programs. So the summer program that I am talking about that lost traction was K through five. Six and beyond still occurs, special ed still occurs, e &L still occurs. So in the event that an administrator said they had um, a teacher or a couple of teachers that wanted to work with students um, on specific things, we would allow that. So we're not offering this summer K through 12 summer school. K 
K through five. K through, K through, five, through five. five. Yeah. We are not from that's correct. Right, not from my knowledge. Yeah. The first year we did, and we also provided transportation. Correct. But I, I do want to emphasize what Ruby just said. If a principal came to us and said, I have five children in my school that need summer academic intervention, K to five, we would take care of that. Correct. So what if a community member or community members came and felt that their kids K through five needed some extra help yeah, they would. for summer school, right? I mean, yeah. I, I appreciate it coming from the administrators. I just feel like lost traction and if, if there's a need I would really hope that we would put that back out and I think I'm Absolutely. pretty sure that was a discussion like I don't want you to think like I'm just saying it lost no, traction I, no, it was a, just, a large no, discussion no, no, I, with I, administration I just want to make sure I mean um, we would accommodate any request for teaching or tutoring over the summer as uh, if the principal endorsed that request through like you said Sue if a community member being a parent went to the principal and said, I need, my child needs X, then they, the principal would share with Cheryl, oh. Mike, Ruby, and then we would figure out a way to provide it. But to run an entire summer school program. No, no, I appreciate weeks, that. I'm just yeah. trying to make sure yeah. that, you know, it was, I, and I, that, I think that that's was a great question, to, and um, our principals should pay attention to that, and yeah. please communicate with us if there's a need for tutoring uh, at that elementary level, mm -hmm. for sure. And I get needs change. I just want to make sure that in the event that we feel that we have yes, is at that grade level that we get that money will be pulled back or however you want. All right, thanks. Not a problem. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. That was longer than I. No, that was good. I know Ashley, you might have a question about the trails. Uh, well, I. Sorry. So I have one more quick question. I was going over the numbers, Cheryl, that you that you gave the 33 teachers at Hughes, uh, 33 at uh, students at Hughes seven self-contained. So that left 26 and with the consultant teacher kind of a model, integrated right? Integrated co-teaching. Uh, okay. So of the integrated co-teach then, the other four teachers are divided amongst those students, the special ed teachers then, so it's six to seven students per special ed teacher. Is that how it works? Because if you have five teachers at Hugh, one of them is with the self-paid students, Correct. and then the other four are Correct. in the CC program. And then so for Kigabai, you have um, 37 students, um, 14 in the self-contained, so you have two teachers with the self-contained, because you said they're divided. So then the other three teachers are divided amongst the 23 consultant teachers. So there's seven to eight students per CT. There's like so, seven-ish. So the model, is, yeah, and, and I, yeah, it's not even, you know, right. but, but I see what you're saying about an average. So what happens is, so let's just, you know, and I, I don't, I, I can kind of, you know, talk a little bit about it. So let's say a second grade at Q's we have eight students, right? What happens is in that second grade at Q's, we have a teaching assistant, a teacher, and a co-teacher. So just for, let's say, you know, even split, it usually doesn't work that way because some of the students need teacher aides. So in second grade, if we have eight students, well, what happened is, is that there would be two gen ed teachers. The special ed teacher would go in between the two classrooms, so you'd have four, te four kids, four kids, when the special ed teacher was over here, the teaching assistant would be over here, and then flip-flop, you know, for the rest of the day. Our cutoff usually, Ashley, is about seven students. So if there are seven students in a grade level, give or take, you know, it could be six, it could be eight, but normally we kind of do seven. That particular teacher, so say third grade at Kegabai, has seven students. That special ed teacher, along with the gen ed teacher and a teacher aide would be in that classroom all day. So if you're right, it does fluctuate depending upon how many kids are in that particular grade level and whether we divide it between two or four or if we have all seven together at one time with the two teachers being together all day, including a teacher aide. So that's, you know, it's, it's grade level. If you want me to get more specific, I can provide that information no, as well. What's the maximum you can have? I know like in the CT model at the high school, for example, we can have up to 20, 20 students per teacher, per special ed teacher on our caseload. What is it at 
I'm, I'm assuming it's much different. Okay. It is. We try. I, I think the I most know what we try, but like, what is the? What are we required to have? So, I we've never gone over. I'm going to say 15 students. Like poor Roseanne O'Brien. I think it was either last year or this year, right? I'm looking at Jeannie and I'm it's looking at Max. Year, yeah. It was last year. She had 15. So you That's know. Max. Yeah. And so she was with eight students here, seven students here. There was a teaching assistant. I think we helped her with maybe two aids or extra TA support when it when it comes to be that number. But since I've been here, it's never really been over 15 that the teachers say. But right now we have about seven or cases. Right seven about to eight. Right, seven, seven to eight. eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like six on the caseload at, at one school, six to seven, and it's seven to eight at the other school. Okay. Right about average wise, yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Good questions. So this next slide, uh, I see we started talking about tech. I just asked a question about trails. I think if you have a question, you yeah, should about the high school oh, trails. I was wondering, what are we doing to the high school trails? I don't know if we went, if we know with the 14,000, what um, is needed for high school trails. This is a special project from a high school science teacher and a club that applied for a grant through monies that were set aside because of the Tonawanda Coke, um, I guess for lack of a better word, lawsuit or uh, monies that were you know given to a you know a big account or a settlement or a fund that could be attributed to people who apply for a grant. In this case, as you can see, it's still on here. Uh, Ruby and myself and probably Hillary need to sit down with the high school teacher because what happened in this case is the kids who wrote a grant were awarded $1,000. But right now, when the initial request is they need the district to award them $14,000. So uh, sometimes when people get excited and write a grant, <laughs> they're not seeing the bigger picture. Hey, we got $1,000, that's really great news. But now where does the next $14,000 come from? So we still plan on meeting with the teacher, trying to decide, is it really 14000 um, And, you know, working it out. Ultimately, it's a great idea. The teacher wants to have a classroom, in essence, in our beautiful woods behind the high school through the trails uh, so that kids can learn about the environment, the ecology, and so forth, in the best possible environment. It's just that sometimes when you write a grant, you can only get 1000 and you need fifteen. right? It's not, it's not doing great. So we, we still have to iron out the details there. Thank you. You're welcome. So Ruby, I see we did talk about the fitness center. Mm -hmm. The high school elevator, we got to fix that. So we just got to fix it. Right, she's so, going to pull out money. The <laughs> <laughs> question about the fitness center is that it's a five-year plan, but are you getting all the equipment up front and then paying it off over five years, or are you only getting a little bit of equipment at a time? A little bit of the equipment at a time. Um, in the last presentation, it shows what year one is, and then um, the uh, PE instructors have also created a list. I did not show it here, but they also created a list of how they will obsolete some of the items um, that they are replacing, and we will keep with that rotation. So they won't be completely um, without. And if we are lucky enough, <laughs> that possibly somebody else is giving away a whole fitness center, then, then maybe it'll work out a little bit different. But it is um, just, just a, just a small part of the five-year five year request. Okay. Which sticks in the front, but what's nice is as it ages, it won't evolve. You'll get to do the same. the same year. Correct. Which is kind of what's nice about the tech equipment replacement. Correct. Because we bought all of that in the same year, and now it's all these two. In the same year, which makes it difficult to do replacement. So, as much as it stinks for the fitness center, if and the tech department at least our replacement will be more staggered when we. I agree. Do it again. A lot of things are uh, done or and brought in as an initiative or corrected during capital work, which means that a lot of things hit that end of use life at the same time, which makes it hard unless you're already in a capital project to kind of bake in the replacement there. 
Um, I am still working with our buildings and grounds crew in reference to the high school elevator. We're just working through the process of getting three quotes. You do see a dollar amount here. Um, it will be fixed uh, if the dollar amount is not too high. Um, I may try to see if it's something we can actually get done this year. If uh, it is where we are expecting it um, for this presentation, my thought process is we do have an architect fee line that we keep within the uh, business and finance area each year. If it's necessary, I can use funds from there, but I'm just trying to see how that plays out. So my initial thought for the next presentation is you will see it being included. My hope is that I can just encapsulate the expense instead of inflating it for a year. Is the elevator operation? I believe it is operational. I truly believe what the issue is is the technology is so old that it can like parts cannot be replaced and it cannot systematically keep up. So the concern is if we do not do this now that it will become non-operational and then in that we will have issues because it is an elevator that students would utilize that need it on um, any type of handicap accessible uh, component as well so it is something that we're looking into a lot I've talked about it probably three times in the last two weeks is fixing the elevator would that fall under one of those $100,000 capital outlays I am. I'm just. I'm just asking the question because I think when the bids elevator. come in, if, if the bids were closer to say seventy-five thousand, then probably. Yes. Right? I, I know we have other capital outlay. I just. I think that if we find ourselves with an unregenerable elevator, okay. we would be so good. Right so, now, all I have is a quote. Right. I was just curious if it was closer mm -hmm. higher. If that was like. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, for sure. Quotes are close to seventy-five thousand. And um, is that a second elevator or is that our only it's elevator? Because we need that for ADA processing yeah. requirements. So we yeah, have to have that. Yes. And, and really, um, we did receive a quote just so the board knows um, and, and really everybody understands. We received a quote, which is where I got the original dollar amount from. But because it is not on state contract, you are required to get multiple bids. And in getting multiple bids, we are trying to be very mindful of the replacement, so it is not exclusive to one company later being able to replace the item. So there's a lot of uh, discussion happening. I'm learning a lot <laughs> in that area as well. So the sixty thousand is for um, a full replacement, not a repair. It is for the full replacement of the components necessary. And I'm I'm not an elevator. <laughs> right, I'm we have the not an elevator <laughs> expert. But that yes, it is not just piecemealing repairs. No, it's it's. But it's not going to be like a brand elevator. You're not a whole no. no, the same compartment will be used. Just the guts will be replaced. Yes, I can get additional info if necessary. <laughs> so. <laughs> Also on this, we have, besides the elevator, the big protectors and youth mental health first aid were rolled into the uh, federal grants, so that helped us out, and the transfer to food service remains a request. That's Title VI grant, that's really different, right? That's really Title, Title IV? Or yes. Title IV um, is funds we receive each year uh, off the top of my head I am finding it difficult to remember what title four is specified for Mike I don't know if you remember title four yeah there's a variety a lot of it's professional Yeah, so Title IV is uh, probably one of our smaller um, grants in grant size, but it is, uh, I personally feel it's the most restricted <laughs> in uh, usage of funds, but it is geared very much around um, 
uh, the core uh, component areas of instruction and professional um, development. I know we go through a lot of that when we are dealing with our non-pubs and helping them identify what they can even use it for when it comes to program because it's not just all areas. And this is the slide that shows the gap to new requests. Correct. Right? So just so that that's where the 398, 225,000 comes from. Um, as Dr. Graham said, um, some of these other areas have been uh, taken into consideration and will be uh, funded through American Rescue um, or the uh, SURSA area. And then um, I did want to express, even though you do see that the health insurance for drivers and aides is a future consideration, we are working with our health insurance broker on some possible options um, for collecting all of that information, and we would bring that for the board probably for a general discussion at some point, and then move that forward how it's selected. But it is definitely something uh, that is for sure to be a future consideration, and um, the dollar amount as well. And it would involve one. Yes. With the SRP. Correct. So again, I think the board is well aware that we've been trying to use the capital outlay um, flexibility that's offered to us at that hundred thousand dollar level. The board knows that it basically means we're going to get paid back close to seventy four percent, seventy five percent comes back to us. So it's really a smart thing for us to do. Uh, as you know, there's a, lot, a big push across the state to increase capital outlay projects from 100,000 to 250. It's it's likely it's likely or perhaps um, close to likely that for the last three years that every this year budget I just like, like, might like allow for this. that. We would not be doing that. Correct. Yeah, we would just stick with the hundred thousand. Correct. Because we just can't. We we just won't be able to take care of that Correct. in this budget cycle. But it is important for the board to know that. The state is finally listening. You know, to do a hundred thousand dollar capital outlay really is when you factor in uh, architect fees and construction management fees, you're really only doing seventy five thousand, you know, give or take. So this will give more flexibility in the future. We just won't be able to participate in that uh, in, some, in July. So we're getting anything important here. This just shows. Um the uh, tax levy maximum increase uh, without request difference, which you'll see is zero, and then with request difference is the 398000 um, that you just saw on the previous slide. So I'm assuming it hasn't really changed. No, nothing's okay. happened in the area of the balance. Um, no changes to the tax cap calculator, um, but we do like to provide it. and. Um, as we have expressed before, the proposed tax rate uh, increase is 56 cents, which is 3.33%. And then the board will approve the actual dollar amount come late July, beginning of August. This is a new um, slide as there were some questions about uh, federal funds as well as the inclusion of federal dollars to offset some of the requests for the 23-24 school year. So what I have done here is these are the major spend areas when you are submitting a grant. So I kind of followed that, um, that display. So you have professional salaries, which is the 0.15. Support is 0.16. Purchase services, which is 0.4. Supplies, 0.4. 0.45, travel 0.46, and then benefits is 0.8. And when we plan each year um, with the state, we have to put funds in these categories. And so uh, clearly your support is your teachers, and it goes on and on um, between different programs you may be purchasing to supplies, to travel, and benefits are just at uh, the benefits for the employees that you're putting in grants. And so we do this submission. So I have provided in each category those dollar amounts. And I also have the uh, grand, I suppose to say grant, budget total. Um, and you will see that in the second to last column. 
And then what I also did is I showed what is available as of 316, uh, 2023. And really, the things that have not been spent are, your salaries aren't fully spent, you're still going through the school year. Um, there are certain practices or um, professional development opportunities or requests that are just spent later in the year. So uh, number one, most of this will get spent down. Um, that's just what happens. As well as there are carryover allowances in different grants, and the rules for those are different as well. Um, Title I has the most restrictive. You can only carry a certain percentage of the actual budget of that year over into the next year. So we watch them very closely. Mike and I meet a couple times throughout the year just to see where he is with spending, um, if there is any carryover that we foresee um, in loss, and we will make sure that we make amendments to spend the money down. Um, Cheryl's uh, 611 and 619 have a little bit more free flow uh, than than others, and UPK is really use it or lose it. If you don't spend it in that year, you don't get to carry it to the next year. Um, but the, the other difference is UPK's dollar amount are set, titles fluctuate. So I also think that's why they allow people to do um, carryovers, as well as 611, 619 fluctuates, they keep those up, up. And then you will see COVID grants, and that is all of the money that we have received pertaining to COVID since 2020. Um, if you remember the first year, the CARES funds were actually baked within the general fund uh, budget. They did a little switch and bait there. Um, and then that changed and you will see uh, SIRSA, so her 2 and ASSERT 2 and everything thereafter is actually federal funds. You have to account for it in the act fund. So it shows you what we were planning for in the different areas, um, where we were for totals. In some of these areas, you actually see nothing there, and that lets you know we fully spent out those grants, and we have submitted the FS10F, which is the final form. And then you will see other ones that have available lines. And then you have um, 611, 619, and homeless, who have something available now but will be spent by the end of this school year. So the two areas that have funds that I am anticipating um, as year-end available are, uh, I'm just making sure I'm reading the right line, so it is SIRSA, a SIR 2, and it is American Rescue, a SIR. And so that totals a little bit more than $1.2 million. And what we're going to do is go to the next slide. Oh, geez. Sorry. It's just really small. Um, so on this slide, you will see how I am anticipating those funds being spent, right? Because there, there's two things, um, and this also, I'm going to talk about deadline dates. So um, the source of funds are through September of 2023. So those have to be spent and done by September 30th of 2023, so this September, um, which fits perfect in the fact of utilizing uh, the funds for vape detectors. It allows us to move forward with that sooner rather than um, later and have things in place truly when school starts uh, for the 23-24 school year. American Rescue serve funds you have until September 30th of 2024, as of right now. They could extend that for a year. I have not heard that from anybody, though. And what I wanted to do here in the notes area is just let you know the items that are included in there for the 23-24 year, most of which were already items that we were planning. That's how we plan the budget, but it does include the Youth Mental Health First Aid, and it does also include the uh, Fitness Center First Year and Technology First Year costs. Are there any questions in that area? No, I think that's good that that we're putting more money for mental health. I think that a lot of this was used, obviously, to the academic purposes of the community.
Not a problem. The um, second area just kind of tells you the flow of our normal grants, um, the grants that we have now and we anticipate uh, continuing, which is um, some of them are July, um, some of them are September 1 through August 31st, which are the titles, and then you will find others, which is everything else really, that runs July 1st through June 30th. And it also tells you when we do the budget prep for those. And it, you know, it kind of seems like, oh, you only take 30 days to prepare for a budget. The state only gives you your information about 30 days ahead of time to really work through that. So we do a lot of work um, in those early couple of weeks in the summer to do preparation for what we anticipate for the, the year. And then this really small, I can't even read it, uh, snapshot here is <laughs> it's a lot larger on the website, um, but that gets into the what was required for American Rescue to be shown to everyone. And so it takes their key categories, what the budget was approved for, what I am anticipating the expense to be, and a little bit of additional information because there will be budget amendments that have to happen to allow for it, um, which is not a problem. You just fill out the information, you submit it to the state, and they approve it and send it back. But I, I just try to be as transparent as possible, and it helps me remember things later on. Any question in reference to the grants? Okay. This did change last meeting, but it hasn't changed since then. Correct. So, so just for joy, just for her to see that. Originally, we were asking for what was it for? Sixty-five thousand. Well, it's okay. We the, the number the number awesome. was close it's to okay. nine hundred thousand. Four and two. I just hit my brain needed to say anything. So it's was four and two. Now it's three and one. Yeah. And this hasn't really changed. This slide has not. That's correct. Okay. And moved so quick. Yeah, sorry. So <laughs> I I think we had a lot of conversation about capital reserve funds. So. This is really for the board and for the community. Just more of a FYI slide that explains a little bit about that. Yes, and, um, and just the benefits of actually having a capital reserve fund. So I won't read this line item by line item, um, but just in reference to clearly less of a burden on taxpayers, and it also will assist with our tax cap calculation. Um, it will assist with our long-range capital planning as we move forward. Um, this, these funds do not have an impact on general fund. Um, we don't have capital reserve funds. Sometimes districts are setting aside or anticipating the use of what is future fund balance. And um, it can also assist, it doesn't always make your, uh, your credit rating go up, but it can assist in that. And then I just thought it was important to also make sure that I outline the steps that happen, not just uh, for board members, but for the community, right? There is an entire process behind one, establishing the reserve, and then funding the reserve, and the voters having to vote to take the funds out, which um, the capital reserve is the most restrictive reserve that school districts have. Most times, I could bring a proposal to the board and say, hey, we should establish a health insurance reserve. And the board can say, okay, we approve it and we move forward um, in that process. Capital does not work that way and it does not work that way to take the money out. So it has community input going in and community input coming out. So I just wanted to outline that. I did a good So again, the last, you know, the big change here is meeting on the 11th, and hopefully uh, we'll have the best understanding of our budget at that point. Any questions? All right. Good. Okay, I can't remember where we are in our agenda. <laughs> Is it me? Oh, okay.
I just I didn't prepare slides because I knew this you know the budget presentation is uh, significant, but I do want to recognize a couple things under the superintendent report. First, Larry Austin, our community relations person, created a digital e bridge, and that went out last week, and we're getting some good feedback. Over 700 people have viewed that digital uh, eBridge newsletter, and I'd like to thank Hillary Prince Harvey for introducing us to the tool called S'more, and uh, this is our first, as a district, our first uh, attempt at using that S'more tool. So thank you, Hillary, and thank you, Larry. Uh, for the board, just if you get a chance to see Mary Howard at the middle school, uh, in your travels, uh, wish her well. She's publishing her first book on artificial intelligence. So the book is called Artificial Intelligence to Streamline, to Streamline Your Teacher Life. And we're very fortunate that we have uh, a very uh, high quality expert uh, working with our kids uh, to the point of being now an author. So congratulations to Mary. And I earlier showed you that we're producing podcasts on a regular basis. So uh, if you're if you just want to go to our website, you can click any one of those podcasts and listen to great things happening with uh, principals, teachers, and students. Uh, I do want to thank the board. I know it's late, uh, but at 7 o'clock tonight, the board engaged in um, a retreat where they learned more about uh, many of the tools that the district uses to support the safety and well-being of our students, teachers, faculty, and staff, and administrators. So I do I want to thank the board uh, for engaging in that retreat. I think we learned a lot today, and I appreciate the board's proactive approach to safety here in our district, and it was a timely presentation today as well. So thank you to the board for that, and that's all that I have for you today. Thank you. And that brings us to the Board of Education report. Uh, the first item is uh, some information at your table. Dave Lowry has um, put in a request to um, serve as the Area 1 Director. Um, it is a retirement for uh, Linda Hoffman's position for the Area 1 Director for NISBA and is looking for a nomination. Um, this is for information only, but if, uh, if we want to go ahead and vote on the nomination now, we can also do that as well. I'm fine with you. I'm fine. I, I, I would even make a motion for the nomination for the vote. All right. A second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0 for Dave. Dave's uh, nomination for the Area 1 Director. Yes, good luck, Dave. He is wonderful. Um, and then uh, next on our agenda, we have the wellness program that. Sherry is putting together with me. Yes, so I um, used the PTA put this flyer together. They did a much, much better job than I did. Um, yeah, yeah, they did such a good job. Yeah, yeah. really good. So I just want to thank our committee. Um, Mr. Antonelli has done a wonderful job doing so many resources. Um, you can see all the vendors. We have um, so many coming over, like 25 vendors will be there. A lot of mental health, uh, emotional health. Um, obviously, it comes in all shapes and sizes, so I like that we have an art program, we have music, um, yoga, uh, and then obviously physical activity is very important. So um, I'm just so thankful to the Wellness Committee because um, they've used all the resources to come up with this in a very short time and done a really excellent job and I'm really excited because it's a district-wide event, um, which is nice because a lot of events are like for the school. This will be, you know, everybody um, of all ages that can come. Um, and what I'm really excited about is uh, nurses from ECMC will be there from the behavioral units to hand out prizes and information to parents. Um, since we, you know, kids get sent there a lot um, you know, when they're in crisis, so they'll bring a lot of information to more parents. And I love like, that connection. I was a board member, so I'm so excited to have them there. Um, so I want to thank all the physical education teachers that have been on this committee. They've done just an incredible job. Um, I want to especially thank Mr. Bokamani. He has done just a wonderful job with helping us with all the tech problems and um, putting everything together and just being really helpful in there whenever we need him. So he's done an excellent job, so thank you, Mr. Um, but I'm excited and we're hoping uh, Dr. Grant we could send it to Mr. Hawaii um, for everybody so that we can you know, um, yeah, from the high school. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this will be district wide. So that was just kind of, thank you for the high school for sending that out, I appreciate it. 
Um, so yeah, we're really excited. Lots of handouts, lots of free stuff. Um, Mr. Antonelli got these amazing bags, and I'm so excited when we steal one when I first came in. But there's like 200 bags that are free with our label on it, and it's just, I'm really excited about it. So thank you. Thank you for all your hard work with that. It should be awesome. So I hope we see everyone on Wednesday, April 19th, 5 to 7 p.m. at Grand Island High School for the Grand Island Health and Wellness Fair. Thank you. Uh, so next is the Sidway PTA meeting from March 21st. Did you want to add anything to that? Well, not really. I just, it's always great to get back to Sidway. Their, their PTA is phenomenal there. It's always strong at the primary level. They're doing a lot of wonderful things. And it's always good to get back into Sidway. So, um, really um, more to add. I know we had, I don't know if Brian Cruz going to mention the risk assessment. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the public comment session. We did not have anyone sign up for general. Oh, you can put it on the very round table. No, we're not on the round table. We're still going to So we tried. And now we're going to be getting to it, though, because we did not have anyone sign up for public comment session. So now we're at round table. Our committee of the whole items information for the round table beginning with Jane. Um, I'm all set. Sure. I want to thank the high school for putting on the uh, Clash of the Vikings. So much fun. My girls had a ball the entire week dressing up. And that night was just, it was really special having a freshman and a senior go against each other. And um, you guys did an excellent job. The teachers did an excellent job. They were so involved and fun. And that ACOS was the best part that you got the video of. I love that. Um, so they just had a wonderful time. Just thank you for all your you know, time and effort and your choice. Hey, um, I just want to thank uh, Mrs. Boutte and um, for organizing the DECA Savers Night. It was a great event. We had uh, several students participate in a presentation uh, about the Savers organization before uh, watching the Savers game, and then they got to go out onto the ice after the, after the game, and it was a victory for the Savers. The students had an amazing time that, um, and also learned a lot too. So thank you to Mrs. Boutte, Mrs. Chamberlain, and um, all of the business teachers that were involved with that DECA night at the Sabres was a great event. So that's all I have. I'm all set. I'm all set. I'm all set. Thank you. Um, I do have one item. Um, Mr. Antonelli and I had the privilege of attending teacher recruitment days last Monday, a week ago from today. It's a super exciting time of year for us to start to pre-screen some of the candidates out there. Um, we also were a little nervous because some of the candidates out there in many of our certification areas um, that we're looking for are also interviewing in many other places with the same needs. So that brings me to a conversation. Um, we, we had a little discussion in cabinet today and we are curious as to whether our board would consider us to allow posting our known positions for next year as a anticipated posting a little earlier than normal. Normally we wait till the budget is actually adopted but as um, hopefully, you know, as I say, anticipated, that means that if anything were not to go through, if there was an issue with adopting and approving a budget, that we would not be hiring in those positions should that happen. Um, so I didn't know if anyone wanted to have any comments, had any comments on that, because I do know that we are hiring in areas that are unique this year, Spanish, high school guidance counselor, middle school special ed, among some other potentials. Um, so that's those are unique areas and we don't see it. We have, didn't find a lot of candidates, but we did see candidates who were well qualified in, in a couple of those areas. I think it's smart too. Yeah. yeah, I've seen it for start point in a number of other districts posted on Facebook, anticipated openings and things like that. They were sending out a little blurb on their Facebook pages that, that I've seen too. We've seen them earlier than a couple other districts as well. And so I know I know our principals will be super excited with that news. I'm being honest in the, in the teacher world of this. 
because a lot of people know when you see something as anticipated that there is another component that the district is waiting on over just posting um, the disclaimer. Right. <laughs> yeah, I just think from the legal yeah. point, like, you know, you don't lose something. I think we can always just make sure there's just a one sentence. Blur, 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 just blur, blur, some I'll look blur. at similar postings. I know some yeah. people have been more specific with that. And yeah. also, I know that when like, mm -hmm. we're getting to screening interviews, I know our principals will communicate that um, at the beginning of those interview processes with all the candidates and say this disposition is contingent on our budget approval process. So, um, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Yes, we appreciate that. So, anybody object? Okay. All right, thank you very much. And Dr. Brennan. Oh, no, sorry. Cheryl Ruby, sorry. <laughs> oh, I guess I look like Dr. Grant today. <laughs> I know, right? I'm all set, thanks. And Dr. Grant. Mine is very quick. Um, we are beginning our risk assessment audit tomorrow. Uh, we did bring the audit committee together. It is focusing in on the area of really revenue receipts, cash receipts, and on food service. So once that is done, we will get the audit committee back together again, and then we will have a report and a corrective action plan. Because they're going to find something uh, for the Board of Education. So you will probably see that, I'm going to guess, uh, late April, uh, maybe beginning of May. Thank you. Dr. Green. Just the uh, wishing everybody a wonderful spring recess, our faculty and students, and anybody taking time off. Uh, students will be returning on Tuesday, April 11th, and obviously starting spring recess next Monday. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so April 3rd to 10th, spring recess. April 18th is um, our regular Board of Education meeting. We have the special meeting April 11th. Um, with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn at 9.56 p.m. And a second. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any extensions? Motion carried. 6-0. Thank you.